Welcome to the first video of Unit 9, the final unit in our curriculum this year. So we're going to start this unit off by talking about the rise of nation states, um, and we're going to take a quick look back at Europe, where we were when we last left Europe, before we get to the specifics of the nation state. Okay, so last time we were in Europe, we were talking about feudalism, feudal society. Um, the Roman Empire had fallen, Germanic tribes were invading, and with these invasions came the need for protection. And so the feudal society developed, where a king was on top, the nobles managed land that was owned by the king, the knights defended the land, and the serfs farmed the land. We also covered the rise of Charlemagne, who was leader of the Franks, and who developed an empire in Europe. Finally, last time we were in Europe, we talked about the power of the church and the growth of the power of the church. The influence of the church, specifically here we're talking about the Roman Catholic Church. And so the power of the Pope grew as more people followed Catholicism, they followed the word of the Pope. Um, and so the Pope and the church itself became very intertwined with the politics throughout Europe. So that takes us to the rise of nation states. The nation states specifically that we're going to cover in this video are England, France, Russia, and Spain. We're going to start with England. So England was first officially united under the Angles. If you remember the Angles, they were one of the Germanic tribes that we covered who moved from Europe uh, over into England. So the Angles, led by Alfred the Great, uh, came into England and they settled there. They named England land they named England England, uh, meaning land of the Angles. After Alfred the Great, several different rulers took control for about 150 years until eventually there was no longer an heir to take over. An heir meaning H-E-I-R, uh, meaning someone who is meant to take over. Um, like you see father to son, there was no more son or um, nephew, grandson, so there was no one to take over. Uh, this is when William came into the picture. So William is on your screen now. William was from Normandy, France. And the Normans were descendants of the Vikings, another Germanic tribe we talked about, uh, but with French culture and language. So William claimed the throne and invaded England, defeating the Anglo-Saxons who had claimed the throne previously. So William the Conqueror invades England in 1066, and he defeats Harold II at the Battle of Hastings. He was a strong and forceful ruler who united England under his throne. So rather than England being separated into different rulers, um, all of England was united or brought together under William the Conqueror's throne. Then after William the Conqueror, uh, we see King Henry II. So King Henry II is R William's grandson. He was a strong ruler with many reforms, including common law, and trial by jury. So common law, he is going to establish a law system uh, that is followed by everybody in England, and he's also going to establish trial by jury. He is going to be um, pretty hands-on as a leader. He's going to send judges to all parts of the nation state annually, meaning yearly, to collect taxes, to settle lawsuits, and to punish criminals. Um, he established the trial by jury in England, and it was the idea that 12 neighbors of the accused who answered a royal judge's questions about the fact of the case would help determine if someone was uh, innocent or guilty. Rulings of the different judges over the years were all combined into what became known as common law and is the basis for the legal systems today in many places, including the one in the U.S. So the ideas of trial by jury um, and the rulings of the different judges are where common law come from in England. King John was William's great grandson. So back with William the Conqueror, his grandson Henry II ruled, and then King John, who is Henry's son, or William's great grandson. He was a weak ruler who was forced to sign the Magna Carta, so he failed as a military leader. He lost Normandy and all lands in northern France to the French. He raised taxes to an all-time high. 
his nobles ended up revolting or fighting back. And so he ended up having to sign the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta limited the power of the monarchy over commoners and created parliament. So on June 15th, 1215, um, the Magna Carta was signed, and it guaranteed basic political rights for the people, and it limited the king's power. So the people were fighting back against King John, and he could not control them. Um, eventually, they had too many people going against him. He signed this Magna Carta, and it gave rights to the people and took rights away from him as leader. It guaranteed rights including no taxation without representation, trial by jury, protection of the law. Um, in fact, he was a, a very poor, he's considered a very poor leader. And if you've ever heard the story of um, Robin Hood, this is the King John referred to in the stories of Robin Hood, of giving or taking from the rich and giving to the poor. So King John is not a very good ruler, um, but he does sign the Magna Carta, which gives people more power and limits the power of the king. Parliament is a body um, of individuals who have to approve what the king does. And so again, this limits the power of the king. Further on, uh, King Edward III is going to claim the French throne, triggering the Hundred Years' War, which we're going to talk about in greater detail momentarily. Um, he also established rules of parliament, meaning um, he established the rules that stated that two upper-class citizens and two knights from every county would be a part of this. So parliament began under Edward I, um, he created the beginning stages of Parliament when he needed to raise taxes for war in France to hold territory. And so it's going to change over time, um, but King Edward III is going to establish the two upper-class citizens and two knights from every county as being part of Parliament. So that is England, the nation-state of England. Then we move on to the nation-state of France. So following the breakup of Charlemagne's empire, lands were ruled under the feudal system. France was divided into 30 feudal territories by the year 1000. Um, Hugh Capet began, a small or began as a small territory ruler, and then he came to rule all of France. So he is going to originally just be at the level of a king, and then he is going to expand his rule, and he will end up ruling what is all of France. The advantages that he had to work with were that he was located right in the middle of some major trade routes when trade started to pick up again as he expanded. And so this is going to be a big advantage for him and the spreading of his power. So Hugh Capet named King of France around 987 AD or CE in Paris. And Capetian rulers unite much of France and expand territory. So not just Hugh Capet, but also his family who will rule following him. Charles IV, IV is the fourth. So Charles IV was the last of the Capetians um, or descendants of Hugh Capet. And he's going to die without a male descendant, leading to controversy over who should rule. The French believed that Charles IV's nephew, Philip VI, was king. However, the English believed different. Um, and so this is going to take us into what becomes known as the Hundred Years' War. Interestingly, it's not exactly 100 years, um, but I guess it's kind of rounded. And it's easier to say 100 years war than the exact name, number of years that, that this war took place. So it's known as the Hundred Years War. And it is fought between the English and the French. And it is fought over who should rule France following Charles IV's death. Okay, so the Hundred Years War lasts from 1337 to 1443. It was a series of wars and battles um, with over 100 years of fighting. Early English victories were due to the longbow, and they fought on French soil. So originally, early in the years of this war, the English are going to be victorious in a lot of different battles. Uh, the French are fighting on their own soil, um, but they are going to continuously lose over and over. The longbow was a huge advantage to the English because it allowed them, um, it's a, a type of bow and arrow, and so it allowed them to attack from far away rather than needing to be right next to somebody to attack them. Uh, so they could take out a lot of their enemy without ever risking their own life. In 1420, 
A treaty was signed agreeing that Henry V would inherit the French crown after the death of French King Charles VI. But before they got to that, um, there is going to be a lot more struggle. So eventually France is going to be victorious in the end. And a big part of that, a big part of France's victory is going to be Joan of Arc. So Joan of Arc is a French woman who was convinced of a holy mission to save France. She believed that heavenly voices spoke to her and told her that the rightful ruler uh, was the son of Charles VI. So she convinced Charles VI and she led, she and he led French troops into battle. Um, she specifically went into battle with them and they ended up winning. The French began winning more battles. Um, and so Joan, what she did is she provided this kind of flip in the Hundred Years War. And she provided a sense of hope for the French. They had continuously lost battle after battle, and it was looking like they were going to lose the war. And then Joan of Arc comes in. She says she has this holy mission. She says she knows who is the rightful ruler. And so this is going to give hope to the French in this Hundred Years War. And then we're going to see a shift after this where the French really start winning more and more of these battles. In 1430, Joan was captured and condemned as a witch. Uh, Charles VI did nothing to help her, and she ended up getting burned at the stake. She was only a teenage girl at the time, somewhere around the age of 19. Um, her vision was, was first given to her, um, according to her, when she was 13. So she was killed around the time she was 19. And so her being burned at the stake... Um, rallied French troops to victory, so it encouraged them even further. So Joan of Arc really was the turning tide of the Hundred Years' War. So the results of the Hundred Years' War were national unity for France and England because they had to fight so hard for what they believed was right, um, that there was a sense of national unity. There was pride for the French because they ended up winning the Hundred Years' War. Um, and the English, at that point, had decided that they were going to focus more on domestic issues, meaning issues in England itself, um, and, de and demand for national armies. So England was going to focus more on England and less on lands elsewhere. This is a very pivotal um, battle in world history because it determined the route that both England and France would go from that point forward. Another nation state we're going to cover here is Russia. So over, for over 200 years, the Mongols had held power in Russia. They demanded obedience and large tributes be paid by the Russians, the people who lived there. They gave limited power to some. In return, they collected taxes for the Mongols and crushed rebellions. So what they did is they used the people who lived there to try to, to um, kind of make sure people were doing what they should be doing and paying the Mongols. So the Mongols had conquered much of Russia under Genghis Khan. Mongol rule lasted for over 200 years and obedience and tribute were required. Over time, Mongol rule would become weak and ended up being focused elsewhere. So once the Mongols became become focused elsewhere, we see Ivan III, Ivan the Great. Uh, he is going to stand up to the Mongols in the late 1400s and the Mongols are gonna stand down. He's gonna stand up to them. They're gonna say, okay, it's not worth the battle anymore. And he is gonna end up uniting Russia under his leadership. He takes the title Tsar, spelled either way, um, and he centralizes power in the city of Moscow, which today still is a very important city in Russia. And finally, we have Spain. Muslims controlled most of the country until the 1100s. Ferdinand and Isabella united Spain and expelled all Jews and Muslims from Spain in an effort to unite their country under Christianity and consolidate power. They believed that they could hold more power if there were just Christians in their nation state. And so anyone who was not Christian was told they could not live in Spain. So they're going to be influential leaders um, in the beginning uh, years of Spain after it is taken over um, from the Muslims. And the Spanish Empire in the Western Hemisphere is going to end up expanding under Charles 
the fifth who is going to be responsible for sending people west.